Okay, so I think we are live uh, again. Um, so hello everybody, welcome back to another edition of Quarantine Thermo. Um, this week we're very excited to, to welcome um, Professor Michele Campisi, um, who I think just started a new position in, in Pisa, right? But you're also associated to the University of Florence. Uh, sorry, I probably should have checked that while we were setting up, but um, in any no. case, is that, is that correct, Michele? That's, that's correct. I'm, uh, I just started a new position as a researcher uh, at uh, uh, CNR, our, uh, Institute for Nanoscience in Pisa. But meanwhile, I keep a lecturing position in uh, Florence. Okay, good. So I didn't, so mess, I didn't mess that up. That's good. Um, it's all, and, uh, it's all in Tuscany, so to speak. Sorry, say that again. It, it is, uh, it, uh, all, both places are in Tuscany, so they're not so far apart one from the other. <laughs> I see. Okay, good. So it uh, wouldn't have been much of a confusion anyway. So uh, yeah, so apologies for the late start. Um, we just had a, had a few connection issues. I hope it's going to hold out during the talk. If there are any problems, of course, we will deal with them as they come along. It's part of the fun. Um, so before I hand over to Michele, let me just reiterate the, the usual format for those of you who may be new to this seminar series. Uh, so Michele is going to speak for us for sort of 40 minutes or so, however long he wants, uninterrupted. And then we'll have questions and answers at the end of the talk. So if you do have any questions either during the talk or at the end, please just write them in the YouTube chat window uh, and I'll relay them to Michele at the end and we'll, we'll have a nice uh, discussion. Um, so yeah, let's move on to the talk. Without further ado, uh, um, I'll hand over to Michele, who's going to tell us about the thermodynamics of a quantum annealer. Please go ahead. Thank you, Mark, and uh, uh, thanks also to John. Uh, your your initiative was uh, is really wonderful. I would say very nice way to keep the community uh, together. So it's a great service that you guys are doing for for the community. So thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm very happy to, you know, have the uh, uh, opportunity to share this uh, recent work that I have done uh, at the University of Florence, uh, as I just said, which is about uh, the thermodynamics of a quantum manila. So the idea here is to uh, uh, consider, basically, to run experiments on uh, uh, a quantum processor, and in particular. Um, we run uh, we ran uh, uh, experiments on uh, a quantum annealer, which is the D-wave um, machine, and to study uh, uh, the operation of, of such device from a thermodynamic point of view. So our idea is to really try and understand the energetic exchanges that are going on during uh, quantum processing. Uh, <clears throat> let me move to the second slide. I hope there is not too much detail, but I take the chance here also to advertise uh, a, a special issue that I am that I am editing uh, with uh, Francesco Plastina on non-equilibrium thermodynamics in the quantum regime, which is going to be published in Entropy. So I want to share it here because I'm sure that there are many people in the audience right now and uh, who would be um, possibly seeing the, the, the watching the, the video later on, which are interested. So uh, if you are interested in, the, in contributing, uh, you are very welcome. Contact me or contact me, Francesco. And uh, um, we are in, in the process now of starting this uh, issue up. But anyway, apart from the um, advertisement, uh, 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 let me get uh, to the uh, uh, topic of, of today's talk. This is a work that I have done uh, with Lorenzo Buffoni, who is a PhD student at the University of Florence. Uh, the paper is on the archive and is going to be published soon in Quantum Science and Technology. I added here the QR code so that uh, you can uh, quickly open it up with your smartphone, if you like. <clears throat> So Lorenzo is the guy who actually uh, uh, programmed the machine and uh, fetched the, the, the results of the, of the, of the run. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, tell you a little uh, about um, uh, the processor that uh, we have uh, uh, studied. Um, 
it's uh, you see here uh, a, a picture of it in the uh, uh, top left side of the, of the slide. That's a photograph of the chip. This is a, a superconducting uh, chip, meaning that it's not based on standard semiconducting technology, but it's based on superconducting circuits. For this reason, the chip uh, is kept uh, at very low temperature in a cryostat, which you see in the middle uh, top part of the slide and uh, which is then put into some big black box. So the interesting thing uh, and uh, so to speak exciting thing is that nowadays all such, uh, I mean this processor and all quantum processors are uh, accessible um, through a cloud service uh, and that's what uh, Lorenzo did. So uh, by, by the quantum service he uh, uh, initialized the, the chip run the experiments and collected the data which was later analyzed. <clears throat> a little bit, let me tell you a little bit more about the basic uh, building block of the device. Uh, the basic uh, building block is the, uh, the qubit and in particular in this uh, uh, case it's a flux qubit. So from the physical point of view that's uh, a superconducting ring uh, interrupted by Josephson junction. Um, it, uh, this uh, uh, results in a, uh, so to speak, in, in a, in a, in a uh, system which is well described by uh, a potential energy which has two uh, wells, as you see in the in the in the pictures. And there are two low-lying uh, quantum states, which are well separated uh, from the uh, next uh, uh, higher state. So. Those two bottom, I mean, those uh, two low-lying um, states uh, are to good approximation. I mean, are form, so to speak, a good uh, qubit, so a good two-level system. Uh, it's uh, um, it's worth mentioning that one of the states corresponds to current uh, running clockwise, and the other state corresponds to uh, current uh, running uh, the other the other uh, direction. So. Actually, these uh, systems can sustain uh, currents which are superposition of clockwise and counterclockwise uh, currents. It's very interesting. And these are, so to speak, mesoscopic devices. They are not too little. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> in, the, in, the, in the chip, those are arranged in plaquettes, and the plaquettes then are connected one uh, to another, mostly with their nearest neighbor, on a graph, which uh, in, in our specific case is the uh, uh, chimera graph, it's called chimera graph. That's, so to speak, uh, defines the topology of the uh, network of qubits that we have uh, used. Uh, good. So let me tell you also a little bit about quantum annealing. The idea is that <clears throat> you might uh, want, for example, to find uh, the ground state of some Hamiltonian, for example, the one which is in green in this, uh, in this slide. And uh, one way of doing that is to uh, prepare a ground state of another Hamiltonian, which is the one in, the one in yellow, and then uh, switch from one to the other slowly in time, so slow that uh, uh, the quantum adiabatic theorem would hold and would uh, drive the ground state of the, so to speak, yellow Hamiltonian into the ground state of the green Hamiltonian. And you might want to do that because uh, you might want to encode the solution of some problem that you have uh, uh, into uh, the, the, um, the ground state of this green, uh, of this green Hamiltonian. So that's the basic idea of quantum annealing. So you have this, your total Hamiltonian, which is depending on some uh, parameter S, which uh, is what uh, uh, is, I will refer to as the uh, annealing parameter. And you see your Hamiltonian is a weighted sum of the yellow and the green with weights that depends on this uh, uh, parameter. So typically in an annealing schedule, you start from S equal to zero, so you start from the yellow Hamiltonian and little by little you turn that off and turn on the green one. So just 
to give you an idea of, of uh, uh, what people are normally doing with these uh, devices. So as I said, this is not what we are, uh, 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 this is not, I mean, we are, what, what we are doing is we are studying the thermodynamics associated to this or similar um, um, evolution of the chip. So in order to do that, um, I am listing here in this slide uh, the, uh, the interactions that uh, the chip has with the uh, external world. So <clears throat> uh, on the right, you see this uh, green uh, 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 circle that represents uh, an, an external uh, work source, which is the one responsible for the time-dependent driving. So basically you are changing a parameter of the chip Hamiltonian in time, right? That results in a time-dependent Hamiltonian for the chip. And that's uh, uh, the result basically of interaction of your chip with some uh, external uh, time-dependent field. So uh, we have a work source here. Uh, in the bottom, I also uh, drawing a, um, like a blue box, a blue square um, that represents, um, so to speak, the um, substrate on which the chip is uh, is uh, patterned, um, <clears throat> which is uh, called, which I mean, is uh, we do, we we are modeling that as a cold thermal bath. So the chip is patterned on some substrate, and that substrate, of course, is uh, subject to thermal fluctuations and possibly um, affecting uh, the dynamics of, of the chip. As will become clearer later, uh, for the time scales over which we have performed our uh, experiments, the effect of this environment is really um, big. So we, it, it's certainly the case that in our experiments one cannot neglect such uh, interactions. Uh, and then there are, uh, uh, the, on, on the um, top part of the slide, you see another square where uh, I wrote preparation. Uh, so we can interact with the, with the, with the chip by uh, basically preparing uh, uh, any state, for example, of the uh, of all sigma z operators um, uh, that we want. Okay, so for example, you uh, one can prepare by you know a, a special um, protocol drivings and you know by interacting with the with the chip, one can prepare, for example, the state that I draw that I drew up there, up down, up 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 down, for example. Well, you can prepare any such eigenstates uh, of the sigma z operators. And then there is on the left yet another uh, uh, interaction uh, channel, which is the readout. Yeah? So the idea is that you prepare, uh, you uh, uh, run the time dependent driving. During this step, uh, you are putting work in, you know, you are possibly doing work on your system or you are withdrawing work, depending on, on a specific case. But meanwhile, your chip is also exchanging heat with the cold bath. And once you are done with the time-dependent driving, you can make a readout of the sigma z uh, operators for each uh, qubit. Now, <clears throat> uh, since uh, we have freedom to prepare such, uh, to prepare the initial state in the, in the sigma z basis, uh, we decided to uh, prepare to do the following, prepare a certain state uh, with a probability that is given by its uh, energy. Uh, I mean, uh, no, okay, to say it more uh, correctly, uh, with, the probability, with the probability which is given by the Gibbs factor with, uh, uh, with a certain temperature T1, uh, uh, corresponding to the energy of that, uh, of that uh, state. So <clears throat> by repeating this uh, preparation running uh, readout many times and averaging, uh, this is equivalent to having uh, uh, the following situation. You have a, a, a preparation which, is, which for all practical purposes is like a thermal bath at hot temperature, for example. 
Then uh, your system interacts with the code path and the work source, and at the end, you make the measurement. Okay, so basically what we have done, we have by, uh, by uh, choosing proper weights for the initial state, we, have mimic we are mimicking uh, a hot thermal bath as uh, the preparation. So that means that here we are actually uh, dealing, we are actually studying a thermal machine, okay? In fact, a quantum thermal, thermal machine, a quantum object which interacts with the hot path, cold path, a work source, and on top of that, we can make measurements on it. All right, so <clears throat> here is the scheme of, uh, of our uh, protocol. We prepare some initial state psi i, corresponding to uh, 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 initial energy EI. This is the eigenvalue of the HZ Hamiltonian. So we prepare basically our, uh, uh, and initially uh, our, uh, uh, pro, uh, our um, annealing parameter is at S equal to one. So we start from the HZ, basically the green Hamiltonian that I was showing before. Then we turn on the X component. We go down here, you see uh, uh, this shadow uh, shape. It's like a V shape. So we, we turn on the X component up to a certain point and then we turn it off again. We do, we do what people call a reverse annealing. During this uh, uh, shadow, as I said uh, already a few times now, uh, you exchange work and uh, hit with the cold bath and uh, at time tau, when the uh, uh, reverse annealing is over, we make the readout of the sigma z uh, uh, um, operator of each qubit. In this way, we fetch, so to speak, the final energy of the chip, and by <clears throat> taking the difference between the initial, the final energy and the initial energy, we can uh, uh, assess the energy change of the chip in a, uh, a given um, uh, annealing. And then of course we can repeat this many times and uh, construct the full probability distribution for the delta E1, the energy change in the chip. Uh, it's average, uh, if you like, you can interpret it as the heat that has been uh, uh, exchanged, that would have been exchanged uh, on average with uh, a real thermal bath at temperature T1, if there were such uh, a real thermal bath. But as I said, we have like a virtual thermal bath. We mimic it by means of preparation. But from the, from the so to speak, physics point of view, it's exactly the same situation. All right, so let us try and make some, some, uh, statements about what is going on here and let's try to uh, uh, model it in order to gain some information beyond uh, the information that we have, uh, 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 I mean not beyond, extract the most information possible from the, from the measurements which are, as I said, measurement of the cheap energy. <clears throat> I go back just for a second. In all this uh, scenario, uh, uh, we have three main quantities, delta E1, so the hot heat, delta E2, delta e which is the cold heat, and W. And experimentally, we have access only to delta E1. So <clears throat> in order to characterize this object from the thermodynamic point of view, we would like to have at least two of them. But that's not... Uh, possible because typically, I mean, in this spe specific scenario, but typically one really doesn't have access to the heat that goes into a bath or even less to the work that is done on an open quantum system such as the one we have here. So, <clears throat> uh, so we have been trying to circumvent this problem and to some extent using uh, 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 the fluctuation theorems we could circumvent it. So let me let me show you how I uh, see uh, the whole situation here. I have a chip in con uh, which I can prepare in any state I want. 
I mean, in any eigenstate of the sigma z operators that I want, which is in contact with the cold thermal bath. So I make now the assumption that the compound uh, system, so this red box and um, black box form, so to speak, an isolated system that evolves unitarily under the action of the external driving. And then, uh, uh, so I have, yeah, and, and, and this uh, a compound object begins in a product state, which is uh, uh, a Gibbs state at temperature T1 or inverse temperature beta 1, which uh, is given by our preparation, and a tensor product with a, a uh, Gibbs state of temperature T2 for, for, for the reservoir. Okay, this whole thing uh, uh, as, uh, evolves unitarily. And uh, so in other words, I'm, I'm, mm, the way I see the, the whole thing is that I, I am facing here a cyclically driven bipartite thermally insulated system that starts in this specific product state. Now, <clears throat> Maybe later I can comment on these assumptions, but let us take them, um, um, you know, let us accept them for a while and let's see where this uh, vision leads us to. So, yeah, I must mention also why I say cyclically driven. Well, I say so because uh, this is a system where the driving, which is here, is cyclical. So it starts from a certain Hamiltonian and then goes back to the same Hamiltonian. You see it in this S of T uh, graph. <clears throat> so in any such case, we know that the fluctuation relation holds. Fluctuation relation for the joint probability of uh, energy exchange delta E1 with the hot bath, in our case, a hot virtual bath, and delta um, um, E2, the energy change of um, uh, the cold bath. In fact, delta E1 here is the energy change in the chip, is what we measure. So probability of that over the probability of observing same uh, exchanges but with uh, opposite sign is given by uh, this uh, uh, well-known exponential uh, form where you have in the exponent basically the quantity beta 1 delta E1 plus beta 2 delta E2. And uh, you probably all know that consequence of that is an integrated fluctuation theorem. And most importantly, uh, in the last line of the slide, uh, an inequality for the average uh, energy exchanged uh, in, with the bath, and um, so which is delta E2, and the energy uh, change of system alone, which is delta E1. You might want to call this the entropy production. Average entropy production is non-negative. So uh, um, <clears throat> before uh, going, uh, let, let me, let, yeah, let, I would like now to list some consequences of this relation. The first one is the following, using the fact that the work is the sum of the energy change in the system and in the cold bath. The previous inequality can be written in a slightly different way as you see here in the first line. And uh, the combination of these two equations uh, tells you that among uh, the eight possible uh, sign combination for work uh, delta E1 and delta E2, only four of them are possible. So two of them are ruled out because they do not uh, um, obey, uh, so to speak, um, they do not obey energy conservation. And two of them are ruled out because they do not obey the fact that the entropy production is non-negative. But so you remain with four uh, possible, uh, po four possibilities. Two of them are very well known, heat engine and refrigerator. And there are uh, two more which are heater, where you spend energy uh, to heat up both a hot and a cold source. And the accelerator, where energy goes from a hot bath to a cold, bath and you uh, spend energy to help this natural flow occur. So <clears throat> we would like, for example, to understand in our experiments which of these four operations uh, takes place. And as I said before, you need to have 
besides delta E1, you need to have either W or delta E2, but the, uh, we don't have access, experimental access to that. Nonetheless, we were able to single out which uh, operation is going on, and I'm going to show you how we did it. <clears throat> we used the following. Basically, we make a change of variable from delta E2 to sigma, the uh, entropy production, which is defined here in top. It's the uh, delta E1 times beta 1 plus delta E2 times beta 2, okay? Uh, uh, with this change of variable, the fluctuation theorem takes a uh, very uh, special form where the probability of certain joint occurrence of sigma and delta E1 over probability of joint occurrence of minus sigma and minus delta E1 is simply given by the exponential of sigma. And recently, uh, Timpanaro, Guarnieri, Gould, and Landi have shown have shown uh, that for any joint probability uh, that uh, enjoys this property, uh, there is a lower bound to the, set, to the entropy production, to the average entropy, entropy production, which is written in terms of the first and second moment of the other variable, which in this case is delta E1. Uh, it's, uh, the func that function is uh, here written in, in the bottom uh, right corner, it's x times the inverse the hyperbolic tangent of x, but that's just uh, some, so to speak, uh, a uh, technicality. The important thing here is that if I have access not only to the average value of delta E1, but I also have access to the second moment, then I can put a lower bound on sigma. It's, to me, this is beautiful. You see, without, we have an open system, and by making a measurement only as, on a portion of it, we get information on the full uh, system. And we are, uh, you are not getting information only on sigma, but you can get information on also on delta E2, so the heat that you dump in the cold bath, and also on the work, because all these quantities are linked together by simple linear relations. So we can rewrite, uh, for example, we can use the tour, the uh, uh, thermodynamic uncertainty relations to put a lower bound also on delta E2, you, you see it here and on the work. And all those bounds are, de are determined once you have access to first and second moment of delta E1. So this that I am showing here is a very, uh, so it's not a special at all. Uh, um, uh, uh, so it's, it's not specific to the uh, um, problem that I am studying. I mean, this idea uh, works whenever you have a uh, driven bipartite, a cyclically driven bipartite system. So it can be uh, applied to other quantum platforms, NB centers called ions, uh, <clears throat> you name them, okay? Uh, okay, but what we did is we applied it here to our specific problem. So let me get to uh, uh, the results of our uh, uh, runs, of our experiments, of our experiments. So we used a simple uh, easing Hamiltonian where uh, basically there is no local field in the Z direction. You see the Hamiltonian in the top right. And um, basically, all the links have the same strength. Uh, and then we do the reverse annealing process, as I just said. So we start with the sigma z part of the Hamiltonian. We turn on the sigma x partially up to some minimum, minimum value for uh, s, which we call s bar. And uh, then we go up again to s bar equal to 1. So in this slide here, uh, you see the uh, uh, very first run, which was for a case of no driving. So we were interested in understanding what happens if we, uh, I mean, first of all, we, don't, we do nothing. So we prepared a system, which is uh, a, 300, a, a spin chain of, uh, of length 300 at infinite temperature and corresponding to uh, initial energy to be uh, zero in, you know, with the convention that we have used. Uh, we let it run for 200, for, uh, 200 microseconds and, uh, you know, we let it run for some time tau. 
uh, and then uh, see what's the final energy. And we repeated this for different uh, values of tau up to 200. As you can see, as, as the uh, uh, time um, uh, runs, the energy of the chip diminishes, meaning that it's really dumping energy in the cold bath. So this certainly, in the, in the time scale that we are uh, showing here, is certainly not an object that evolves um, <clears throat> unitarily. I mean, the chip alone is not evolving unitarily. We have to uh, uh, consider that it is uh, in contact with the cold bath. So far, so good. So uh, then we started with our reverse annealing shadow. So we fixed the final, the total duration of the of the driving, which was 100 microseconds, and we uh, check. Yeah, we have been checked. Yeah, we have checked uh, how the final, so, so to speak, how the uh, average energy change in the chip um, changes as we change the value of S bar, which is the minimum value of S in our annealing schedule. So you see that <clears throat> uh, if you start from S bar equal to one and you decrease it. Basically, the uh, the energy exchanged quickly drops down to the values minus two, which is basically uh, indicating that our chip is going very close to the ground state. Uh, so, if S bar is uh, small enough, let's say around 0.5 or, or even less, but it doesn't make much difference if it is less than one half. Uh, basically, it, uh, our annealing schedule make uh, the system go from an infinite temperature uh, uh, to something that is very close to uh, a zero temperature. Okay, in other words, it loses energy much faster than it would have uh, done without uh, uh, driving at all. Yeah? You see pre in the previous slide, maybe I go back, in the previous slide at 100 microseconds, we have or more or less minus 0 0.3, minus uh, 0 0.3, that's the energy change in, in, the, in the system. And here, uh, at S smaller than one half, we already are very close to minus two. So it, it, it dumps energy much faster in the, in the cold bath uh, uh, when we uh, run this, um, this shadow. Next slide is the variance. Yeah, Re remember we need the first moment and the variance of the chip energy change in order to to say something about the bounds. Uh, the plot here is very similar, telling that uh, we are getting uh, um, the, so the variance of delta e is very small, meaning that we are you know getting very close to a, a ground state. Indeed, yeah, that's another indication of it. Uh, <clears throat> next slide here shows the lower bound on the entropy production. Here we see a uh, similar behavior, but of course reversed. Uh, what happens is that if you move S bar from one to lower and lower value, you see that it, uh, it very quickly, the, the lower bound on, on entropy production quickly goes up and then more or less stabilizes or reaches a plateau. <clears throat> for values of S bar smaller than, uh, than one half. So, of course, uh, this is only a bound on this entropy production. Eh? We don't know exactly where the entropy production will be in the graph. It's above this line, but this already is an indication, this graph is already an indication that most likely, um, if, you, if you go uh, to values of S bar that are smaller than, than one half, you're going to dissipate a lot. There is much, uh, there is most likely more dissipation uh, if you if you do like that, and there is very low dissipation if you are uh, if you if you remain close to one uh, with your S bar. <clears throat> Next slide. Now this is the 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 uh, bound on delta E two. Its uh, plot is actually the same as before. It's only scaled by the temperature of the cold bath, which we have estimated. Um, right, and very similar behavior. 
if you go to S smaller than one half, more or less, you're going to dump a lot of energy. It, it, this tells that you're going to dump, dump a lot of energy into the cold bath, which make, makes sense, no? Your system uh, loses a lot of energy and it loses it to the cold bath. And here the work, uh, yet again, is similar to the entropy production. Uh, this is again the lower bound. Uh, if, if your S bar is close to one, nothing much happened, but as, as uh, very quickly as S bar decreases, you are going to spend a lot of work. Um, you are going to spend uh, a lot of work. Okay, so, uh, and reach a plateau, you see, at, at for, uh, and reach a plateau for a small enough S bars. So I'm, I'm close now to the end of the talk, so let me tell you some remarks. First of all, it's an accelerator. Why? I mean, we could only measure delta E1, which was negative in all our runs, but since we have uh, the bounds and uh, on delta E2 and W, and those bounds are non-negative, we know that delta E2 is larger than zero and W uh, is larger than zero. Here I'm talking about average values, which means uh, uh, what is going on is that energy goes out of the virtual hot bath, going into the cold bath, and we are spending energy for that thing to, to happen. So it's a thermal accelerator, actually. Uh, <clears throat> second remark, uh, uh, I, I repeat what I've already said. So there is large dissipation as you cross the value S bar one half, and that point is the quantum critical point. So that's the point where our uh, uh, Hamiltonian, uh, where in our Hamiltonian gaps are closing. Uh, so why is that so that you dissipate a lot when you cross that? It is so uh, because basically uh, the, the spectrum becomes, uh, so to speak, almost continuous if you have uh, enough you know, a large enough number of spins, and in our case we had to, uh, 300, I remember. <clears throat> so it means that uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, frequencies now that your uh, uh, chip uh, can resonate with. Uh, so in other words, there are much, many more channels of uh, interaction and resonance with the, um, with the substrate which allow for, for, for large dissipation. So uh, this is our understanding of, uh, of uh, what we are observing from a thermodynamic point of view. Uh, we think that it's related really to the crossing of a quantum critical uh, point, uh, which is at zero temperature. Uh, but that's not actually uh, what we mean here. Uh, what I mean is that the gaps close and therefore you have uh, channels Many more channels for 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 this for dumping energy into the into the cold bath. All right, let me just mention before I thank you that um, this uh, uh, observation here also uh, creates a link with a lot of ongoing research regarding, for example, kibble zurek mechanism in uh, uh, open quantum systems. There are some theoretical and numerical studies, for example, by Rossini. Uh, and Vicari, uh, which is which was out uh, very recently in Physical Review Research. There is a paper by Sebastian Daphner in Physical Review E, also about this topic, and also a paper with by Zurek and others, which performed uh, experiments on a quantum annealer like us, like we did, uh, but they were really focused on the um, so to speak scaling of the uh, production of defects when you cross the critical point. So. Um, just, you know, I, was, I want just to mention these possible uh, connections, um, which perhaps I will explore in the future. Uh, well, then uh, that's it with this. I will thank you very much for, for your um, attention. And uh, uh, um, I apologize for uh, being a, a little uh, late earlier, but uh, there were some problems here with uh, my connection. I hope it all went uh, smooth uh, later on. Thanks to everyone. <laughs> Thanks very much, Michele. Um, yeah, so actually the connection was perfect, despite what we we originally feared. I think everything was was, was great and it was a really nice uh, clear talk. So thanks for that. Um, so uh, yeah, as as I said, we have lots of time for questions, guys. So um, 
feel free to to just write things in the YouTube chat window. There's a little bit of a delay, so um, maybe I can kind of kick off um, with a couple of questions. So, um, I mean, one of the so one of the questions I had was about, I mean, so essentially. Uh, okay, first of all, I'm, I know very little about this uh, transverse field easing model. So some of these are going to be basic questions, but about the kind of quantum phase transition and so on. So, I mean, I, I would naively have kind of expected a sort of sharp peak at the transition point, but instead you, the, all the quantities kind of saturate as you go past the transition point. Is, is that something to do with the fact that the gap closes and, and stays closed in one, one phase? There's something that I vaguely remember from the icing model. Is that correct? Uh, in, in my understanding, uh, things are staying quite uh, um, flat below S1 half because uh, you see, once you have opened your, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, your valve, no, once you have opened all the channels of interactions and then you reclose it, that's what we are doing. We are opening and closing. But once you have opened, the heat has, has gone, has flown. So even though you close it later on, it's not going to make much difference. So it also, it's also an indication that uh, the real, there is a fast energy exchange that occurs as you get across the, uh, as you get close to the, to this um, critical point, then there is a, an avalanche, so to speak. Okay, maybe avalanche is, is exaggerated, but mo a lot of it will go through um, when you are close to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the critical point, and that's because, yes, at that point, the, the spectrum, the gaps in the spectrum close, so mm -hmm. it's really like opening up a valve for the heat to flow. That makes sense. Okay. Uh, yeah. So it's actually kind of saying that all, of the, that all of the significant dissipation is occurring just at the critical point, because it doesn't matter yeah. how much further you go as long yeah. as you come back. Yeah. Okay. That, thanks. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, the, the, the lower is this S bar, the more, uh, uh, I mean, if you're above, you never reach the, the critical point, but if you go below, either you reach it or you surpass it, it will, it will not change, it will not make much difference. It's the important point is that you cross it. Yeah. Okay. Or you reach it. Maybe, maybe better said, if you reach it, then basically it, it's uh, whether, you, how, uh, it doesn't really, uh, how uh, you know how farther away you go from it after you cross it is not going to affect is not affecting much the thermodynamics we see it from the graphs okay thanks that that's very helpful cheers so uh, we have a couple of questions coming in now so um, by the way lots lots of claps and thank yous from everyone in the audience um, so um, the first question well, um, the first question we have is from uh, Nadja Bernades uh, who says Michele nice talk thanks. How do you estimate the temperature of the cold bath, beta 2? So what we did, let me go uh, up with the slides. <clears throat> Basically, uh, uh, for example, here. So we see that uh, uh, if we run uh, such a schedule uh, for an S bar, which is smaller than one half, basically, our system uh, dumps all its energy, and if we take now larger, uh, if if we let it now run uh, further in time, it will not move. It will not move much from there. It, we we saw it from the some of some from some runs. So it means that uh, this uh, uh, reverse annealing schedule also makes the system thermalize very thermalize thermalize quickly. So. Uh, uh, in the bottom uh, left part of this graph, basically, it's, uh, I mean, uh, for us, it's reasonable, it's, it is reasonable to think uh, that it is in thermal equilibrium. So we took the statistics of the energy in this final state, and from there, using some like maximum likelihood methods, we inferred the possible temperature of it. That's how people typically do it in uh, in, in in such uh, quantum annealing devices. They use uh, maximization uh, methods to infer from the energy statistics uh, the temperature. We don't have any proof that it's really thermalized, but you know it's uh, it's it's plausible because we are seeing that things are not changing. So for us, uh, that's an indication that uh, thermalization has been reached and. Assuming that 
then we infer the temperature, assuming that the, the final state is actually thermal. Okay, thanks <clears throat> very much. Um, so, yeah, we have, uh, I think, a couple of questions from, uh, from our Giacomo Guarnieri, who says, Hi, Michele, two possibly very basic questions. Um, so question one, uh, you mentioned that the annealing procedure is used to connect ground states of two models. Does this work also for other energy eigenstates? Uh, and did you use this in the preparation procedure? Uh, okay. No, I didn't use it in the preparation procedure. I mean, uh, for us, preparation procedure was really like, it's a, it's a piece of code, no? In that, that you run and I don't know exact, we don't have control on what is really going on on the chip. We just know that if you run that code, uh, they, so to speak, guarantee you that you're going to start with that. Um, with that state and no, we didn't use the, so yes and no to the first question. So uh, uh, yes, if uh, you prepare uh, uh, one um, eigenstate, let's say of, uh, 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 let me go up so that uh, you guys see, the, uh, see the, the slide. So imagine you prepare an eigenstate of the yellow Hamiltonian, not necessarily um, <clears throat> the, the ground state, and now you do an annealing schedule. If the the, um, the hypothesis of the quantum adiabatic theorem holds, then you will go on to the corresponding uh, eigenstate of the green one. Mm -hmm. This, but if the, the if the uh, hypothesis of the theorem are uh, are, are 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 obeyed, so. What we saw here is that in the time scale that we are uh, considering, it doesn't work. I mean, the, uh, the chip is not at all evolving unitarily. So it's, in, my, in our understanding, so that's another remark that we have, the reason why quantum annealing works is not really much because uh, the heat, the, 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 so to speak, the um, uh, quantum, uh, adiabatic, adiabatic theorem works, but it's because uh, your system interacts and may interact a lot with the thermal, but at very cold temperature, which keeps it uh, close to ground state. So it's because of it's a it's a, so to speak a very cold isothermal process rather than a thermally insu insulated uh, adiabatic one. Mm -hmm. You but see, is, but, isn't that a thermal annealer instead of a quantum one? I mean, uh, yeah, but quantum also plays a role here because clearly, I mean, uh, uh, the, this object, it's at the same time subject to quantum dynamics and thermal one. So right. it's both of them, but it's difficult to understand uh, to what extent it is quantum and to what extent it is thermal. What we see is that in the time scales that we studied, there is a lot of thermal, um, a lot of thermal <coughs> uh, uh, noise going on, but it's also true that I mean, uh, 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 that happens much more when you cross the uh, critical point, and that's a quantum critical point. I mean, that, that happens because the spectrum closes, and the spectrum closes because it's a quantum system that has a certain non-commuting observables there. I mean, it's because sigma x does not commute with sigma, sorry, with the green, with the yellow does not commute with the green one, that there is a, a, a structured so to speak, uh, spectrum that closes. So it's yeah. really an interplay of quantum and uh, thermal. Uh, if I may add one last thing regarding the question of Giacomo, mm -hmm. another situation, another case where uh, the uh, quantum adiabatic theorem breaks is when there is a crossing of, le of levels. And uh, you see here in our case, uh, clearly when S goes close to one half, uh, uh, there is some gap closing or becoming very small. So you have to be, you know, you should have, uh, in order for the quantum theorem to work, assuming that there were no thermal noise and such, you also would need that the time scale of your, um, the change of your parameter should be much uh, slower than the slowest uh, uh, period associated to the uh, gaps. You know, so if the gaps get really close, that means there is a time scale that uh, diverges and you have to be much slower than this diverging time. So um, 
I hope this uh, answers uh, Giacomo's questions. I'm not sure it was completely clear, but I hope so. No, I, I think you were. And I mean, there's another question from Giacomo, which actually kind of leads on from your last point, I think. So he, he asked this question too, is, uh, is, is there some difference expected if one changes the annealing schedule from a linear ramp to another functional form? Uh, okay, as, I think that as long as you do this, uh, uh, so we did reverse annealing, so we didn't really do this linear one, we did uh, this uh, reverse annealing one, so from one to S bar and back to one. Mm -hmm. I think that if you do some other strange shape, starting from one and going to some minimal S bar and going up, it will not make much difference. So what is important for the, uh, um, uh, so what will count in the graphs mo uh, uh, mostly is the minimal value of S bar, how, so to speak, uh, time you stay in the vicinity of that point, and uh, how long is your total driving. So yeah. I don't expect much differences. Yeah. Uh, w uh, maybe this gives, us, gives me the, the, the opportunity to say why we didn't do the uh, linear annealing. And the reason is that uh, uh, the measurements can, can be done in the sigma z basis, right? So we decided to start from sigma z and go back to sigma z so that we can you know, uh, make the measurements uh, in the sigma z basis, have the initial energy in the sigma z uh, basis and you know, compare. Uh, uh, same Hamilton at initial and final time. I see. Uh, you must be telepathic, sure. Michele, because I think you just answered the next question I was going to read out, which, I mean, I just checked that that really does answer the question, but it's from Tanoi uh, Pandit who said, why do you do re reverse annealing? Can you do this yeah, experiment yeah. using the forward annealing only? I guess the, what you uh, just said is the answer, right? Yeah, yeah. but yes, I think that in principle could, could be done, but, um, you know, there are some technical issues uh, mm. over there. I mean, they give you so in principle, the answer is yes, but in practice, I'm not sure that the wave with the cloud service gives you such a freedom to prepare and read in one basis and read in the other. So uh, Lorenzo Buffoni know better because he's the guy who did the, the whole thing. I don't know if he's online, maybe he can answer on the chat. I don't know if he's online, uh, uh, so I'm not okay. I'm not fully fully sure. So in principle, yes, it could be done, but uh, certainly it, it was much more uh, difficult from for Lorenzo to do it, if not if if if, if not even impossible. <laughs> I see, because they give you you know a certain set of things that you can do. You cannot just go there and say ah I do no. There are limits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. No, it makes sense. Um. Okay, so thanks for that. I think uh, that's. I think I got all the questions there. Um, so this is a good moment maybe to conclude. So uh, thanks once again to everyone for tuning in and especially thanks so much, uh, Professor Michele Campisi for a really interesting talk. Thank you, Mark. And thanks to everyone. <laughs> See you guys soon. <laughs> yeah, let's hope so, right? <laughs> <laughs>